Yo, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Babylon Talmud. Today we have the privilege of studying together the 10th page of Masech the Shabbos. I know that yesterday I referred to Masech the Shabbos as Masech the Brachos. Although the interesting thing is that there's actually a lot of stuff, a lot of references today from like Masech the Brachos kind of things. Or even yesterday, right, with Tefillah Samencha and stuff. So maybe I wasn't totally incorrect in calling it Masech the Brachos. But let's just say on the surface I was incorrect. All right. Um, Today we're continuing to riff on like what the Mishnah got started with yesterday with um, uh, if you inter- have to interrupt for like Mincha and things like that and then we get on to some kind of Agadatas almost like Brachas kind of vibes. Um, yeah, so without further ado, let's um, let, let, let's move on. Alright, so we're going to start in the uh, Tess Amud Beis, two, four, six lines from the bottom. Amr uh, Abayi, Hani Chavin Bavloi, okay. So our friends in uh, Bavel, right? So yesterday we said that in Bavel, they, when they would start their meal, they would um, loosen their belts, right? So our friends in Bavel, Lamanda Amrit Filas Arbis Rishus, okay? So if you remember back to Masech the Brachos, there was that whole machlok between Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi, Gam- and Rabbi Gamliel. If you say Tfilas Arvis is optional or obligatory, that was that whole story where they cleared out all the where they basically deposed uh, Rabbi Gamliel from being the head of the academy. So, according to those who say that uh, Mariv is optional, so Kevin the Sharle Yone Lo Le. So then, once already they uh, loosen up their belt, and at that point, it's considered that they've begun their meal. So, so we we don't we don't uh, tell them to um, stop in order to dive in Mariv because after all, it's Rishos. But the Gemara says one second. But Abai, doesn't that imply that if you say that Marev is obligatory, then you would interrupt your meal in order to pray Marev? But what about the fact that everyone agrees that Mincha is obligatory? There's no question about that. Marev is a question. Okay, it's Machlok. Is it, is, it, is it obligatory or optional? But everyone agrees that Mincha is obligatory and yet... We say that once already you start eating your meal, Zeo, enjoy. You don't have to stop in order to dive in Mincha. So why would you have to stop in order to dive in Marib? So, Amr Rabbi Chanina, Mishiyat Chaguro, and Rabbi Chanina says over there that once already you loosen up your belt, that's it. You're in your meal. You don't have to interrupt for Mincha. So why is Marib more strict? So my answer is, Hasam lo shkicha shechrus, hacha shkicha shechrus. Oh, that when it comes to Mincha, it, it's less common for people, at least at that point in time and in that context, um, I do understand that there are places where it is common to uh, drink during lunch. But um, at that point and in that context, at least, drinking alcohol during lunch was not common. And therefore, um, you didn't really have, to, really have to worry about people getting carried away and missing mincha. So if you already started eating, you can, can you can continue eating. But hacha shchicha shechros. But at night, it's more common to drink alcohol, right? Maybe to have some wine or some beer with your dinner, um, and therefore, who knows? You maybe maybe you'll get a little carried away, and you might miss marv. So we say, um, even once you've begun your meal, you should interrupt your meal in order to pray marv. Inami, or else. The mincha came in the kviyale zimna mirtas velo asi lemifsha. Arvis came in the chule lelios man arvis lo mirtas vasi lemifsha. Right, um, there, are, or you could say that when it comes to mincha, there's like a, a pretty well defined time for praying mincha, right? Mincha, right, you could basically, the earliest you could pray mincha is six and a half hours into the day, and it goes until 12 hours into the day. Whereas marv, it's basically like, you can pray marv anytime at night, all night. So because it's less well defined, you know, it's more common, we're more concerned that you're gonna say, like, oh, whatever, I'll just dive in after my meal. And then maybe you'll go and like, I don't know, watch some kind of, television show or something and you'll be like okay wait, i'll just have marv after that and then the next thing will come and keep on pushing it off and you might you might end up missing it so therefore we say whatever you're doing stop and pray marv mask of lord of sheishas of sheishas asks the question he says one second first of all i don't understand we're saying that once he opened once he loosens his belt then he's ready in the meal and too late he loosened his belt he, you know that that that's it it doesn't have to daven Mincha anymore, or Marv, or whatever it might be, if you say it's Rishos. Like, I don't understand, is it so hard to freaking close your belt 
that it's like, no, he already went through all the effort of like loosening his belt. That's it. We're not going to make him tighten it again in order to, to pray. And also, if it's such a big deal to freaking, you know, close your belt, so then just pray with a looser belt. Who cares? So the Gemara says, well, there is a reason why not to pray with a loose belt. Because it says, prepare yourself before your God, Israel. Um, so therefore, we don't want you to just pray with the, with the, you know, with your eyes and falling down. So, okay. Rabba by Ravuna Rami. Puzmike umatsle. So Rabbi Barpuna would put on fancy socks when he would daven. I guess that would be very fancy and they would be considered preparing yourself before God. As Rashi says, he called the cross Elokecha, his lefanov. Make yourself beautiful before him. Um, okay, I wonder why socks was such a big deal back then. Maybe they wouldn't pray in shoes, maybe. Saying like if you were wearing socks, maybe then it was like a nicer. I don't know. Rava Shdiglime. Rava would kind of do in some ways like the opposite, but he would have a different approach. He would take off his fancy cloak that he was wearing, and he would sort of wrap one hand in the other, and 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 he would pray. Um, and Rashi says, right, as if a person who's sort of like uncomfortable, he's you know in in front of the fear of his of his master. Right, Amar Kavda Kami Mare, and uh, Rava said, you know, when I pray, I try to imagine that I am a servant in front of his master. Amar of Ashi, Chazina Lele of Kahana. So Rav Ashi says that he witnessed Rav Kahana ki ikat sayr ba'ama when there was something difficult going on in the world. Shdi glime ufachoyadu umatzli Amar Kavda Kami Mare. So he would, when when there was a challenging, you know. Uh, Kufa in the world, and so there, was, there was hard stuff going on. So he would take the Rava approach, which is he would take off his fancy cloak and he would wrap his hands, you know, one in the other, probably put it opposite his heart, and and be as though he was a servant in front of his master. Kikashalma, when there was peace in the world, lovish umiskase umsatev umatsle. He would get all dressed up and mechubad, and he would pray. Um, he said, prepare yourself before your God is ill. It's almost as if there's like two different types of davening, right? There's the davening when things are difficult and you like, you know, need, you know, you're asking God for help. So then you're not going to get all fancy over there. It's more going to be like a servant in front of his master, like a slave in front of his master. Whereas I guess when things are more peaceful and, you know, it's kind of more of a, let's say, friendly relationship with God. I don't know friendly is the right word, but, you know, Kilu, you know, you're not asking for much. It's more like you're just spending some time with God. So get all dressed up for the occasion. Rava Chazi Rav Hamnuna, the Kamayach Pitzlo, say this is pretty cool. So Rava saw that Rav Hamnuna was davening for a very long time. And Rava was completely confused. This makes no sense. Here, Rav Hamnuna has the opportunity to be studying Torah, which is Chaya Olam. It's, it's, it, it, it's life of eternity. And all and he's sitting here just praying and praying and praying and praying, asking for food and money and who knows whatever gosh mystica thinks he wants. Made no sense to Rava. For who suffer, but from Nunas held, Zman Tfila Lechud, Uzman Torah Lechud. That's really cool. Love it. That the time for prayer is one thing and the time for Torah is another thing. Everything has its own time and place. And when I'm praying, I'm not thinking I better finish my prayer so I can get back to learning. And when I'm learning, I'm not thinking I better wrap up my learning because I got to go pray. Rather, when I'm praying, I'm praying. When I'm learning, I'm learning. Pretty awesome. Rabbi Yirmiya, Ava Yosef, Kamed, Rabbi Zera. So Rabbi Yirmiya was sitting in front of Rabbi Zera. Rabbi Aska, Bishmaita. And they were learning together. Naga, and it was getting late to Davin. Rabbi Kamasai, Rabbi Yirmiya. And Rabbi Yirmiya was trying to like hurry up and, and wrap things up so that he can, that he can Davin and not miss this man. Koryale, Rabbi Zera. So Rabbi Zera said to Rabbi Yirmiya, if a person turns his ears from, from, from listening to words of Torah, also his prayer will be an abomination. Which is super interesting, right? Meaning, it's like, it's already Zman Tefillah, and yet, and yet, um, meaning it's Zman Tefillah, it's time to daven. Rabbi Yirmi was just trying to go daven, and Rabbi Zer was saying, forget about davening right now, we're learning. If you think that you can like stop learning to go daven, well, your prayer is not going to be anything. Which is kind of like what the chassidim, you know, some of the chassidim would do, right? They they would da, they would learn, and even if it means that right that your prayer you're going to pray later, well, the point is that we're learning, you know, what kind of prayer you're going to have if 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 you can't even if you have to run away from your learning in order to pray. Interesting. 
din. At what point is it considered the beginning of a din? Right? Yesterday we were talking about, right, the Mishnah listed a whole bunch of stuff that you shouldn't do right before Mincha. Um, and if you do them, then you don't have to interrupt. And, right, things like getting a haircut, going to the bath, tannery, things like that. And then the last one on the list was um, judgment. And we haven't yet, right, when, when we said what's considered the beginning of your meal, we then got carried away with all these things, you know, even, we even got it, we even got into like Mariv and Rishus and all sorts of stuff. Now we're getting back to our list and we're saying that Din, at what point is it considered that the case has begun, that the judgment has begun? So, Rav Yirmiya, Rav Yona, Chad Amar Mishay is Atfu Adayonin, Chad Amar Mishay Yiftichu Ba'aladinim. This is really interesting. Apparently the judges would wear a talis when they were sitting in, in, in judging. I, I guess they probably do it nowadays as well. It's pretty cool. Um, anyways, so one of them said that once the judges put on their talis, it's considered as though the case has, be- the judging has begun. And the other one says that once the uh, litigants begin their arguments, so, um, that is one, that is, it's considered at that point that the case has begun. For the plie, they do not argue, it depends. If the judges were already, you know, uh, presiding on a case before then, and they were already wearing their talis, well then of course, it's not going to be considered the case from when they put on their talis, they're already wearing their talis. So in that case, it would be when the litigants begin their arguments. However, um, if the litigants, uh, if the judges were not judging beforehand, well then uh, it's when they put on their talises and indicate that they're getting started. Rav Ami Rav Asi, Avu Yasve, Vigar Sebeni Amude. So Rav Ami and Rav Asi, they would sit and learn between the pillars of the Bissamedrish, I guess. V'choshayta v'shayta, havu tafchei ha'ibro didasha, v'amrei, i'ika di'isle dina le'o v'leise. And every hour, they would bang on the bolt of the door and they would say, if there's somebody who needs a, uh, to, uh, something judged, um, come and, you know, come to us and we'll, 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 we'll handle it. Rav Chizda, Rav Abar, Rav Huna, havu yasve bedina kule yoma. So there was one day where Rav Chizda and Rav Abar Rav Huna were sitting in din. They were like being on a bezdin, mamish, the entire day. They didn't get to learn for even a second. Havu kochalash libayu. And at the end of the day, they were completely exhausted. They hadn't eaten the entire day. They were completely exhausted. Tanalu Rav Chia Barav Midifti. So Rav Chia Barav Midifti said to them, "Like guys, you're not, you're not, you're not doing this right." Vayamu Ra'am Amoshim in Aboker Ada Arab. The pasuk says that Moshe, that right, that the nation stood upon Moshe from the morning until the evening. Right, the Moshe right with Yisro. Right, so the Moshe would, was basically taking care and judging, presiding upon the Bnei Yisrael. All day, from the morning until the evening. Do you really think that Moshe Rabbeinu was just, um, you know, judging the entire day from the morning till the evening? When do you, when, when did he have time to learn then? So, to say to you, No, when it says that Moshe was judging, presiding over the nation from the morning until the evening. All it's saying is that morning and evening, right? What does the Gemara say? Right? When it says morning till evening, it doesn't literally mean that he was presiding over them all day. It means that he was, that um, it says, right, Boker and Erev, just like it says by my Sebracious, by Erev, by Evoker, right? To say that any judge who even judges uh, a, a, a case truthfully, even for one minute, even for, I guess, one minute or one hour, it's Ke'ilu, he's a, he's a partner with the Abishter in creating the world. Very, very cool. Admosa Yoshim Bedin. So now, until, so okay, fine. So we said, you know, that, that, right, that uh, you shouldn't be judging all day long, right? Because, um, so it's too much, you know. We saw that uh, that right, that um, Rav Chizda and Rabbi Bar Rav Huna judged all day long, and uh, and and by then they 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 were spent by the end of the day. So how much time should they put aside for judging? At what point should they then say, okay, come back tomorrow, we're gonna go learn? So Amr um, Rav Sheshes Adzman Suda. So if Shesha says um, they would they would go and the bezdin would be open until the time of suda. And we're going to figure out what ta- what 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 time is the time of suda. But until that time, that's when they would judge, and then I guess they would eat epis, and then they would go they would go um, learn. Amr of Chama Micra. Where do we have a pasuk 
that says that um, you, they would judge first and then and then eat. So Dixiv, as the pasuk says in um, in Koheles, Ilach Eretz Shemalkech Noar Visarayach Baboker Yochelu. Woe is to you a land that your king is you know acts like a lad, like a child, and your and and the officers eat in the morning when they get up. Ashreich. Is it Ashreich or Ashraich? Ashraich Eretz Shemalkech Ben Chorim Misaraich Ba'es Yochelu Begvura Velo Bishasi. Right? Uh, um, happy are you, that, um, and fortunate are you, a land that your king is the son of uh, wealthy people, right? I.e. that he doesn't, you know, it's not all new to him, right? It's not new wealth that like, you know, he's spending on himself and, and being corrupt, right? Rather, he's, you know, he, 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 he's more... Uh, um, I guess deliberate in 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 his ways, and the officers by ace yochelu they eat at the proper time, right? They don't just immediately get up and and fress and eat, right? Rather they get up, they take care of what they need to take care of, and then they eat later. Bigvura velobishasi, right? They're taking care of things like you know making big decisions like about wars and you know all sorts of governing things, and then right and then they eat velobishasi and not. You know, with uh, just drinking too much wine and partying. The Gvura shal Torah velo b'shtiya shal yainin. The Gemara Darshans in the Gvura and the strength of Torah, not in the drinking of wine. And therefore, um, the strength of Torah. Oh, and then we're. Oh, oh, oh. And did Rashi say Shadayan kori mel? Oh no, that's something else. Okay, he says Dayan is called a melech, so that's a king. But also, we learned in Brachas and Daf Vav Mud Aleph, right? That that um, Din is also called Torah. Right? So therefore when it says Bigvura Shal Torah, it also means Dinim, right? Because the Gemara and Davav Amun Aleph of Brachis said that, right, Elohim Nitzav Ba'adas Kel, that God is found among the judges. And we said, because it was a Havamina, we needed to say that Elohim Nitzav Ba'adas Kel to say that um, God is even with three people. But the question was, if he was even with two people, then why do I need to say that it was with three people? So you might have the Havmina to say, well, Din is not considered Torah. Therefore, even though he's with two people who are studying Torah, he's not necessarily with three people who are judging. So the Kamash Malan, that Din is considered Torah. And then we drew sort of a, a connection to say that in Torah is Tefillah, and that is how, or Kriyashma, right? And that is how we knew uh Uh, I don't know. Now, now I already forgot. But I guess that that was the point that um, that even three people who are sitting studying in Torah, um, then God is with them. And we see over here also so that we said bigvura shel Torah velo b'shtiya shel yain. So the gvura of Torah in this case would be judging. Okay, fine. Tana Rabbanan the rabbis taught shal rishona Michael ludim. Oh, so the first hour of the day is the Michael ludim. This is insane. These ludim were these people who were cannibals. Yuck. That's gross. At least in my opinion. Anyways, the first hour of the day, people, the, is when the cannibal people eat. Yuck. Shnia maicholistim. The second hour of the day is when the thieves, the bandits, eat. Shlish is maichol yorshin. The third hour of the day is people who have inherited wealth and never really had to work for it. They just kind of have wealth and they can eat at a nice, um, convenient time of the third hour of the day. Revius Michael Poalim. The fourth hour is when, you know, the go-getters who are like busy all morning getting to work and, you know, having to take care of things. So they finally get around to eating in the fourth hour. Chamish is Michael Kuladom. And then the fifth hour of the day is, um, is when, is when everybody else eats. Ini is the fifth hour really when everybody else eats. Ve'amra Papa Revius is Mansuda Lakol Adam. But Papa said that the fourth hour of the day is what is is when everybody eats. Okay, fine. El revius ma'echol koladim chamishis ma'echol palim shishis ma'echol tamid echacham. Rather, the fourth hour of the day is when everybody eats. The fifth hour is when the workers eat. The sixth hour is when the tamid echacham meet. So I wonder if so if maybe when Rav Shesha says that they would judge until this man suda, assuming that they're tamid echachamim, which I imagine that Rav, well, which definitely Rav Chizda and Rav Barufuna were. So maybe it means that they would judge until uh, the sixth hour of the day. Okay. Mikan ve'elach kazorik evan lachemes. However, if you eat after the sixth hour of the day, it's like you are throwing a stone into a um, pitcher of wine. And actually the Mesorah Sashatz explains that this means that if you have like a container of wine and it's not completely full. So if it's not completely full, then I guess the oxygen is going to cause the wine to oxidize, 
and become vinegar. So what you do is you actually throw a stone into the wine in order to fill up the container so that it won't oxidize. Um, however, when you do that, um, the, 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 the um, stone is, you know, the wine isn't going to be as high quality as if it was just completely filled with wine. And the same thing over here, right? If you throw something into your body after six hours when it's empty and you're just there to fill it up, so it's not going to be as good as if, you know, there already was, you know, the best thing would really just not be to throw something into an empty body, but to kind of keep it full. Um, now this uh, uh, metaphor of throwing a stone into an uh, into an empty um, container is only if you have not eaten anything in the morning. But if you've eaten throughout the you know in the morning, then there's nothing wrong with eating after six hours. Okay. Amar of Ada Barahava says the Holy of Ada Barahava. A person is permitted to pray in a shvitz in a in a bathhouse. Now, in order to understand this Gemara. We have to understand the how the bathhouses worked back then, at least according to the way that Rashi describes them. So there were basically three rooms. There was an innermost room, a middle room, and a, and a first room. So the first room is where you would get there, and then I guess you would strip down to your underwear. Then you would go into the next room, and you would get completely completely naked. And then you would go into the third room, and that's where the schwitz was. And that's where all the fun schwitzy kind of things were, like the hot pa- the hot pool, the plunge pool, the, you know, all that stuff, the schwitz, the plaza. <laughs> Anyways, so, so, so that's how it would work. Now, so therefore in the first room, everyone was wearing clothes. In the second room, some people were wearing clothes, some people weren't. In the third room, nobody was wearing clothes. Okay. So now, Ravada Barahava says you're allowed to pray in a bathhouse. Now, the assumption being in the third room, where everyone's naked. If somebody enters into a bathhouse, so if it's a, the first room where everyone's wearing clothes, so you're allowed to, um, you know, study Torah, you're allowed to, well, generally that's like verses of Tanakh, I guess. Um, you're allowed to pray over there. Certainly you could say Shalom to your friend. And we're specifically referring to Shalom because as we're going to find out on Amud Bey, Shalom is one of the names of God. Right now, I don't know if that also means that in English you shouldn't say peace because peace is the equivalent of shalom. I'm not sure, but the point is you shouldn't be saying shalom because that's one of the names of God. Don't say shalom aleichem or something like that. So we're saying so in the first room you're allowed to say shalom. So umaniach tefillin, you could put on your tefillin over there. And certainly, if you come into the first room already wearing tefillin, you don't have to take them off. In the middle room where some people are wearing clothing, some people aren't. So yesh sham sheilas shalom. So you're allowed to stay, say shalom still, but ve'en sham mikra utfila. But do not, you know, study Torah or pray. Ve'enu cholitz tefillin. If you're wearing tefillin already, you don't have to take them off. However, ve'enu maniach lechatchila. But you shouldn't be putting on tefillin lechatchila. Malcolm shabni adam omdin arumim. But in the third room where people are standing naked, ve'en sham sheilas shalom. You shouldn't be saying shalom. Ve'en tzarich lomer mikra utfila. And certainly you cannot. Um, be studying Torah or praying, which were already not allowed in the previous room. V'chol it's tefillin, you have to take off your tefillin, ve'en tzarech lomar she'en omanichan, and certainly don't put them on the chatechila. Nu, so we see that in the innermost room, you're not allowed to pray. So why is Ravada Barahava saying you are allowed to pray? So kikam Ravada Barahava, v'merchat she'en bo adam. So Ravada Barahava is saying you're allowed to pray in a, um, besamerchat, in a bathhouse that doesn't have anybody in it. Ve'amar, Rabbi but din Rabbi Yossi Bar I believe that's the same Rabbi Yossi Bar from Tfilos Keneged Avos Tiknum fame. And the Avchavav of Masech Debrachos. Doesn't he say that when they say not to pray in a um, uh, Shvitz, that's even if there's nobody in there and not in a bathroom, even though there's no excrement in there? Ella. When Ravada said that you're allowed to pray in a shvitz, it's a brand new shvitz that nobody's ever been in. But one second, Ravina asked, he said, what happens if you set aside an area to be a bathroom, a besakise? Would you be allowed to pray there even though nobody's actually used it yet? And he didn't have an answer. So therefore, wouldn't the same thing apply to a bathhouse? 
And therefore, we, you know, there, there's no definitive answer of whether or not you can pray in the bathhouse. So why is Ravada Barahava saying you are? So low. No, they're not comparable. Dilma, shiny base, akise de mice. Maybe a bathroom is different than a bathhouse because it's, has more sort of disgusting connotations, more unpleasant, uh, connotations. Whereas a schwitz, it's very nice. So therefore, so they're naked people, but it's not, uh, necessarily a, a place that you associate with like disgusting. So maybe it is allowed if it's new. And apparently Vada Barahava holds that way. Ein sham shelas shalom. So we say that in a bathhouse, you're not allowed to say shalom aleichem. So misayeh le ravam nuna. Mishmei de Ula. So this taka um, supports Ravam Nuna in the name of Ula. The Amar, also the Adam Shitin Shalom Lachaver Bevesamechat, um, who says that it's forbidden for a person to say Shalom to his friend in a bathhouse. Mishum Shenemar, Vayikur Lo Hashem, Shalom. That Gidon made a Mizbeach after he saw an angel and he called the Mizbeach Hashem Shalom. So we see that one of the names of God is Shalom. So don't say Shalom in the bathhouse because you're saying one of God's names in the bathhouse where people are naked. Well, then can you also not say the word faith in or belief in the Beisakise? The God who is belief worthy. Yeah, that's 100% correct. You can't say Emuna in the bathhouse. You are allowed to say emuna in the Beisakise. So hasam shem gufe lo ikre hachi. Dim tagminen eloha mehemna. Hakela ne'eman is not saying that God's name is ne'eman. God's saying, it's saying that God is ne'eman. God is, you know, trustworthy. But he's not saying that God's name is ne'eman. Hacha shem gufe ikre shalom. Here, God's name is actually Shalom. Tirsiv, as the Pasuk says, Vayikolo Hashem Shalom. He called him Hashem Shalom, i.e., God that is Shalom. Therefore, we don't say Shalom in the bathhouse. Oh, someone who gives up his present to his friend, he has to let him know that it's coming from him. So Rashi gives two reasons why. One of them is because maybe, you know, if you just kind of give somebody a gift and you don't let him know, you know, who gave it, maybe the person will feel bad. Like, why does he feel like he's somebody who has to receive gifts? Um, but the other one is so that, It's at the end of the, of the Rashi, three lines into the thin lines. So because of this, he will love him, right? Meaning, we want to be um, um, encouraging friendship and love between people. So therefore, you know, if you let your friend know that you gave him a gift, it'll, it'll you know, create good vibes between them. So we want to do that. Shnemar, as the Pesach says, Shnemar, Ladas, Keni Hashem, Kadishchem. Right, it says in the Torah, uh, uh, Pesach Gimel on the page, so it's from uh, Sefer Shmos, V'ata Dabra al-Bnei Yisrael, Leymor, Achaz Shabsosa, Tishmoru, Ki Osi, Beni, Uveneichem, Lador, Seichem, Ladas, Keni Hashem, Kadishchem. I'm giving you Shabbos, and I want you to know that it is me who makes you holy. I.e., uh, God said to Moshe, I want you to tell them that I'm, that I'm giving them this gift of Shabbos. Oh, not only did he give us the gift of Shabbos, he gave us the gift of Mesechta Shabbos. Tanan Amiyachi, we also learn in a verse like this, Ladas ke'ani Hashem mekadashchem, to know that I am God who makes you holy. Amr the Kaddish Baruch Moshe, the Ebishter said to Moshe, Matanatov v'yeshli b'veiz kinozai, I have a very great gift in my storage house. V'shabbos shma, you know what it's called? It's called Shabbos. V'ani mevakish litna l'Yisrael, and I want to give it to Israel. Leich v'odiyam, go and let them know. Mikana Reb Shimon Gamliel, and from there Reb Shimon Gamliel, from here Reb Shimon Gamliel said, "Hanosin pas latino tzarich lo dioli imo." This is really interesting. <laughs> it's interesting to things to 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 see how things have progressed over fifteen hundred years. That I guess fifteen hundred years ago it was still okay for a stranger to give bread to a little kid. Nowadays, of course, you would never do that because we have fifteen hundred years of experience of knowing that even though. Um, in theory, in most cases, it would be okay. Although the question is, who, what kind of stranger is giving bread to a kid? But let's just say, you know, even though in most cases it would be okay, there are the cases that would not be okay. And for their, for their, for that reason, we just say, this is not something that we do anymore. We don't just have random strangers give little kids bread. But back then, I guess it was still okay. Um, so if a, um, benevolent, um, adult, gives bread to a little kid, he should tell his mother, um, you know, in order to create good vibes. Although it's interesting because Rashi said, right? One of the reasons for giving a, a gift is that 
uh, they will it will it will it will encourage love among each other. But I don't know why he necessarily wants to encourage love with this kid's mother, um, unless it's love that's permitted. In any event, my avidle, how exactly are you going to get the message across to the mother that you gave her child bread? <laughs> you basically uh, take oil. I don't know why he had oil and eyeliner on him, but you take oil and uh, and you put it on his forehead and then you take eyeliner and put it around his eyes. The kid comes home looking like a freak. The mother's like, oh, who gave you bread? And then the kid's going to be like, yeah, yeah, this guy gave me bread. And everyone will be like, wow, I love living here. People are so nice. What about nowadays that we have to be concerned that if a kid comes home with eyeliner and um, um, oil, we have to be concerned that maybe some witch kind of spooked him. So maybe it's not such a good idea to do the whole eyeliner and oil thing. So my, so I'm a papa, shayf le me also min. So I don't know, you, I don't really get it, but you basically um, um, smear on him from that min. So I guess if you gave him, I don't know, epis grapes, so like take some grape juice and put it out on him, I guess. <laughs> I guess if you gave him bread, I don't know, somehow some kind of maybe beer. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Ini, is this really true that um, when you give somebody a gift, you should let them know? But Reb Chama Reb Chanina said that somebody who gives um, a gift to his friend doesn't need to let him know. Shneimar, as the pasuk says, Moshe lo yada kikar nor panav b'davuito. Moshe had no clue that when he came down from the mountain, his face was shining with light from God. I.e., God didn't tell him that he gave him this gift of radiance. So Lokasha, it depends. If it's obvious, if it's going to be obvious that, oh, God gave him a gift, then it's okay. Meaning, he came down from the mountain and his face was shining. It's obvious that he's shining because he was just standing with God for 40 days. But uh, if it's something that you're not necessarily going to know, like how are you going to know who gave your kid bread? So, 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 um, so then you should tell the recipient that you are the one who gave it to them. Um, yeah, but what do you mean? But, but, but Shabbos, obviously we're gonna say, we're gonna find out that we have this Shabbos thing once a week and came from God. So why, why did Hashem need to tell Moshe to tell them that He's giving it to them? So, yeah, that while Shabbos itself, it will be clear that it came from God, but the schar that you get for it won't necessarily be clear. So God was telling Moshe to tell the Bnei Israel about the schar that they will get for keeping Shabbos. Rav Chizda. So Rav Chizda was a Kohen. And interesting, Rashi brings further a proof. How do we know that Rav Chizda was a Kohen? He brings the proof from the Gemara and Brachas. If you remember, Daf Memdalad Amar Aleph, it said that um, there was a city in Eretz Yisrael where there were, um, I believe, 80, what was it? 80, right? Yeah, there were 80 pairs of sisters that were Kohanim, to, or Kohanos, married to 80 pairs of brothers who were Kohanim. And in Bavel, they mamish looked all over the place, and all they were able to come up with was the two daughters of Rav Chista. Who were married to Rami Barhama and Marukva Barhama. And even though Mar- Rami Barhama and Marukva Barhama were not Kohanim, but the daughters of Rav Chista were Kohanim, so Kohanot, right? So clearly Rav Chista was a Kohen. So now, there's a halacha that when you shecht, I don't know if it applies to any animal, but definitely an ox. So when you shecht an ox, you give the Zroa Lechayim Vikeva to a Kohen. It's what's called the Matnos. I think that's what's, uh, whatever, you get these Matanos. To the coin, right? And that is the, um, the cheek, the, um, arm, one of the arms, and the stomach. You give that to the, um, coin. And then the coin can do whatever he wants with it. Now, I'm not sure what the luck is nowadays. Um, but in any event, Rav Chista, even though Rashi points out, even though Rav Chista was living in Bavel, so it might imply that not, that applies nowadays, he says it's not so posh. So I, I don't know what the Allah, I don't know what, what the Allah is, Allah Lamaisha, but, Lamaisha, but there is an Indian that whenever you shecht an animal, you give the Zoral Chayayim Bekeva, to a coin. So if Chizda Avanakid Biyaditarte Matanta de Torah. If Chizda was holding, um, you know, two different people gave him, shechted an animal and gave him the Matanos, these gifts, um, and he was holding them. And Omar, he said, Komando Asi va Omar li shmait sachadata mi shmei dirav, yevnale niale. And Rav Chizda said, look, if anybody can come and tell me, um, a Chiddush that I've never heard before, in the name of Rav, because Rav was his teacher, right? Rav Chista is often, often quoting Rav. So, so if somebody can tell me something new that I've never heard of from Rav, I'll give you these gifts that were given to me. I'll give them to you because he can give them to whoever he wants. That's not the case with Truma, but it is the case with these Matanos. Rav by Machasya, so Rav by Machasya, who keeps on saying stuff on this page, he came to Rav Chista and he says, look, 
This is what Rav said. Somebody gives a gift to his friend and needs to let him know. Shenemar, as the Pasuk says, to know that I am God who made you holy. And sure enough, Rav Chisda is like, that's awesome. And he gave him these gifts. To which um, Rav, uh, Rav Barmachasya said, wow, you like really love teachings from Rav so much that you're willing to give me the, all this meat? Amale in. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm crazy about teachings of Rav. I, I just want to learn as much as I can. Uh, and yeah, I'm totally happy to give away some meat in order to learn something new from Rav. Amale. So um, Rav Barmachasya responded, wow, Hanu the Amar Rav, this is, you know, what Rav said. Milsa al Bishayu Yakira that a a garment, a coat, um is very valuable to he who wears it. So like your coat is not so valuable to me. I don't own it. I have my own coat. I don't really care that much about your coat. But my coat is very valuable to me. Maybe I like it, maybe I like the way it looks, maybe I, it's a status thing, maybe it just it simply keeps me warm, right? But 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 the fact that it's my coat, um, I care about it. So here also, Kilu Wow, you're a student of Rav, therefore you're crazy about the teachings of Rav. Amalei, Rav Chista said to Rava by Machasya, Amar Rav Hachi, Rav really said this? Wow, that's amazing. Wow, I actually like the second statement of Rav that you just said, even more than the first statement of Rav, which was clearly um, awesome enough that I gave you these gifts. And he says that if I would have had more gifts to give, I would give them to you. That because of the um so 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 um Rav Barmachasya says the name of Rav Chama Baguya in the name of Rav that a person should not show any sort of favoritism to one child over another. Because of the Mishkal Shnei Slaim, right? This value of two Slaim. And Rashi, Rashi says it's Lav Davka. But the point is like, you know, for this, for this one thing that Yaakov did to show favoritism to Yosef over the other brothers, he gave him the Ksonis Pasim. Look what happened, right? It caused jealousy and, 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 and one thing led to the next and everybody ended up in Mitzrayim. Krova. A person should try to live in a city that was built recently. Because since it was only built recently, its sins are very few. They haven't yet had enough time to build up a whole bunch of sins. As the Pasuk says, So Lot requests from the angels, Look, can we just stay in this city over here because it's um, close by and it's small. My krova, my mitzar. What does it mean that it's close? What does it mean that it's small? Ile ma krova, de mikarva vizuta. If it, if it means that kilu, it's close by and it's small. Well then, vaka chazula, the angels could see that it's close by and it's small. What, what, what's the chiddush of lot? Ele mitoch she shiva sa krova, avonosea mutzarin. But because, um, it was only settled, settled recently, it doesn't have that many sins. Amr abi oven, my kra, where do we see this in a pasuk? Tirsiv imalta na shama. Right? Lot says, I will please run over there. Na, bigamatria, chamshin vichar have. Na, nun aleph, and gamatria is 51. Right? Vishal stom, nun bez. And stom was 52 years old. So it was one year younger than stom. Therefore, it's, it, it had fewer enough sins that it was able to be spared from being destroyed. Vishal vasa, chavav. Um, out of the, tw- out of the 52 years of, uh, Stom's existence, the last 26 years of it were peaceful. Um, so, so, it says that Stom were enslaved to, um, Kedal Omer for 12 years. They then rebelled for another 13 years. Right, and then in the fourth year, the fourteenth year is when uh, they had the big showdown, with, and Avram got involved, and 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 that's when they defeated Kedar Omer and they got their independence. So that was twelve years of slavery, essentially fourteen total years of rebellion, which is twenty six, um, and which means that there are another twenty six left until it was destroyed, um, and it was destroyed in fifty two years. Okay, awesome, friends, Gishmak. Um so yeah, we just got into a bunch of like uh, agaritas there at the end, almost rem- almost reminiscent of brachos. 
very different from the first, uh, uh, the other initial dapim in Shabbos, which were um, much more uh, involved and complex. Over here, there was like, uh, so yeah, man, this Gemara thing, it's mamish like, uh, it's mamish like uh, uh, an ocean, you know, with the ups and the downs. And, you know, one daf can mamish be like, you know, Rishus Arab, Rishus Ayachid, Mavui, Lechi, Chatzar, Yud Tfachim, Dalad Tfachim, messing up with Dal Ramis. And the next one is like, you know, Agadita is about giving gifts and judges being like they helped out the, the Abishter in creating the world. But Mamish, Mamish, the, it's, it's Mamish, the jumping into the ocean of, 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 of Gemara, which is what makes it uh, such a, su, 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 such an amazing thing. So thanks everybody for, for joining along and uh, I, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Peace out, y'all.